Well, good morning. I hope most of you are awake. Uh, I know it's a little challenging this morning. Uh, I just want to say, I can't really believe that it's Friday already, uh, and uh, our last chapel for the week, and I just want to uh, say it has been an incredible privilege to get to spend the week with you, uh, to share God's Word with you, to share meals, to play Frisbee, uh, to, uh, to sing together, to worship together. Uh, it, is, it is a privilege of mine, and I am, I am blessed and encouraged by your faith and your obedience to Jesus, and you have been a blessing to me. So I just want to say thank you uh, to each of you. Uh, I would do want to uh, encourage you and remind you that it takes an incredible amount of work and effort to make Chehi happen. Uh, you probably have no idea of all the things that go on. And uh, from our directors, uh, to our office staff, to our music staff, to our counselors, and to our incredible faculty. And I just want to encourage you, as you see them throughout the day, uh, whether, it's your fa- whether it's your teacher, your ensemble director, counselor, office staff, our directors, just say thank you uh, and let them know that you appreciate uh, all that they do. Because they're here for one reason, to glorify God and because they love you and they want to see God at work in your life. And so I'm grateful for all that we have been able to encounter this week. The week's not over. I'm looking forward to the rest of today, all that God's going to do. I'm looking forward to skit night. Uh, always an incredible time. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to our bonfire or bon as it may be uh, tonight and what God's going to do there. And I'm so excited to uh, listen to the concert and experience the concert tomorrow. So lots still to happen. But this morning, uh, we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 11, and then we'll be in, in Matthew chapter 14 a little bit. But this week, uh, we have been on a journey talking about what it means to have a fresh start. And I, I have been praying and believing that God is going to give each of you a fresh start. And as I talked about yesterday, wherever you've come in to this place, right, whatever place in your, your walk with Christ that you've come in, that God would do something fresh and new in your life and that you would leave here closer to Him, more desiring to live for Him and for His glory and for His purposes. God saved you on purpose. He created you on purpose. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And so I'm praying that you would experience a new level of obedience, Right? adopting God's will for your life. I, I'm praying that you'd have a new level of wisdom that you would walk and that you would ask yourself that question, what is the wise thing for me to do? That you'd have a new level of love, that your love for God would be deeper, but that your love for people would be deeper. That you would walk in the light like we talked about yesterday and that you would deal with areas of sin and darkness. Don't walk in the dark. Walk in the light. And today I want to talk about faith. Now, faith is a very broad subject, and there's a lot of different things that we could talk about when it comes to faith, but if you're going to experience not only a fresh start, but a strong start, you have to live by faith. God has designed and ordained that our relationship with Him would be on the basis of faith, and that not only is it faith that brings us into a relationship with God, you are saved by faith faith through grace, right, or by grace through faith, but not only that, but that you would then live or walk by faith. And so as we think about faith and the crucial aspect in our life, I want us to just begin Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And it says this, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So the author of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible, it's just absolutely impossible to please God, to, to live in a way that is honoring him, to live in a way that is glorifying to him, to live the life that he's called you to live. He says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, when it comes to faith, God has given us reasons for faith. He has given us evidences to see, evidences to read, evidences to experience. And so faith in God is not against reason. In fact, faith in God has many reasons. But it is something that goes beyond reason. There is a supernatural element to faith. And God has ordained that you and I would live by faith. That this is the condition that we're to meet. I quoted Ephesians 2.8 a moment ago. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so all of you have exercised faith. 
Now, some of you, many of you have exercised faith in God. You have put your faith in God to save you, to forgive you of your sins, to give you eternal life, to give you a relationship with him. But whether or not you've, you, you are a Christian or a follower of God, you have exercised faith. You have trusted something or someone. In fact, even right now, you are trusting the seat that you're sitting in. Right? You, you sat down in that seat, and whether you consciously did it or not, your brain made a decision that this, this chair, this seat can hold me, and I'm going to sit in it. One time, uh, when I was pastoring in Florida, right not long after I had taken the church there, uh, some people invited me over to their house. Uh, they actually lived on the intercoastal waterway. We were going to fish off their dock, but we went into the house first, and they said, sit down. And so I sat down, and the chair broke. And that was a little embarrassing. And then he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, that's the broken chair. And I thought, wow, it would have been nice if you told me that before. See, I put my faith in that chair because he invited me to sit, right? But my faith in that chair, right, it doesn't matter how much faith I had, right, it's the object of our faith that matters. And so all of us are familiar with faith, we've all exercised faith, but we all know that faith also is a challenge. How is it, and how do we live by faith? How do we live in this way that pleases God? And how do we, because there's, there's so many challenges to faith. There's so many things that, that make faith difficult. And it could be something that you've experienced or gone through. It could be just doubts that you deal with. It could be fear. Anybody ever been afraid before? All right. Yeah. Fear is something that we all experience at different ways, at different times, and different levels. And fear sometimes attacks our faith. Doubts, anxiety, all those things that we go through make faith difficult. And so while faith has its reasons, and faith isn't unreasonable, it is difficult sometimes. And God isn't asking you to make a blind leap, but he is inviting you to a life of trusting him. Uh, uh, I read this from a theologian. He said, physical eyesight produces a conviction or evidence of visible things, but faith is the organ which enables people to see the invisible order. A.W. Tozer said it like this. He said, faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. And so our faith is our ability in a spiritual sense to see God and to trust him and to follow him. And so as we live a life of faith, it requires focus. How many of you would say, and this is definitely me, that focus is difficult sometimes? All right, definitely. For this side of the room, it's 100%, all right? About 75% over here. Yeah, focus is hard. Uh, When I was growing up, man, focus was hard. School was hard. And when I was in elementary school, we had something called second recess, which is as amazing as it sounds. But there was a catch. See, everybody got first recess. That was an inalienable right. But second recess was reserved for people who got a certain amount of their assignments done. And our teacher would have the assignments on the board. There'd be like five of them. I remember them. And she would draw a line like after three. And she's like, if you have completed these assignments by this time, you get second recess. And I was always, I mean, recess was great. So I was excited for second recess. But I was also a daydreamer and maybe, possibly a procrastinator. Maybe. And so our teacher would say, all right, five minutes. And I'm still on assignment number one, barely, right? I don't think I ever made it to second recess. Ever. All right, sad story. So I know focus is hard. Focus is hard. And when it comes to focus in a spiritual sense, it can be hard as well. Without faith. So here's what I want to read a verse from 2 Corinthians. You don't have to turn this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And Paul says this, and I think it's really key when it comes to our focus. He says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And Paul wrote those words in the midst of suffering and of trial and of difficulty. He endured so much hardship in life, pain and suffering, difficulty. He was beaten. He was tortured. Right? He was imprisoned. And he says, we fix our, he says, my faith isn't built just on my experiences here or what I've gone through or what I see, but my faith is built on what is unseen. And the unseen is eternal. 
Back, back to Hebrews 11. It says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards, notice that he rewards those who seek him. Now what is the reward? And, and this is important. What is the reward of faith? Is it success? Is it getting your prayers answered? Is it getting the, the position that you desired? Is it getting the chair in, in orchestra or band that you wanted? Is it getting into the college you want? Is it getting the job you want, the spouse you want, the house you want? Is that it? No. The reward of faith is God himself. He's the reward. It's not stuff or things or status or achievement. That's the reward. And you know, we talked about motivation a little bit earlier this week, but anything that we do, we need motivation, right? You need motivation. You have to have, you know, the end in mind. Right? There's a man named Stephen Covey who wrote a book a long time called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And number two is begin with the end in mind. You need to see, where, where is this going? Because I need to see what the goal is in order to endure the pain, the difficulty, the challenge that it takes to get there. And so for us as followers of Jesus, he says that faith is required to please God. We're invited to draw near to God by faith and that there's a reward for those who seek him. And his reward is his presence. Psalm 27 verse 4 says, David said, I asked one thing from the Lord. This is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. David says that the prize, the thing that he most desired was God's presence and to see and experience his beauty and to seek him in his temple. Hebrews chapter 11. If we're back there, if you look at verse 1, if you have your Bible open, as we get a good definition of faith. It says, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You know, faith is seeing what is not seen and acting upon it. Faith is a gift from God. And that's an incredible thing. But we have to exercise that gift, right? We have to exercise that gift in order to experience it in our lives. God gives faith to us as a gift. We don't have to try to have faith. We have the ability to have faith because God has given us the ability to have faith. But we do have to exercise it. Many of you are incredibly talented, incredibly intelligent. But you still have to what? Begins with a P and ends with rectus. Hey, you got it. Practice. All right. Very good. I wanted to help you out as much as I could because I know the brain doesn't work super fast in the morning. Right? Even if you're incredibly talented, you still have to practice. You still have to sharpen and shape the talents and gifts that you've been given. Even if you're incredibly intelligent, you still may have to what before an exam? Study. Study. Remember that. It's really important. When I think about faith... Uh, there are a lot of examples in Scripture, but I, I want to focus on one for just a couple moments that's in Matthew 14, and you're certainly welcome to turn there in your Bible if you'd like to. Uh, in Matthew chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 25, uh, we encounter uh, the disciples of Jesus, the twelve. They have been called by Jesus, they're following Jesus, they're serving Jesus, and they've just experienced an extraordinary event, uh, an amazing event, and sometimes God does things in our life that are extraordinary, that allow us to see him. It's a pulling back of the curtain, if you will, and allowing us to see him. And so Jesus has, Jesus has taken a very meager amount of food, right? A very meager amount of food, and he has fed thousands with it, right? We call it the feeding of the 5,000. The Bible says it was 5,000 men plus women and children. So there is a, a ton of people that have just been fed with one small meal, five loaves and two fish, right? A meager meal, barley loaves. It was the, loaf, it was the food of poor people. The fish were, were probably dried or pickled, right? I mean, anybody down for pickled fish and barley? All right. Yeah, it doesn't sound so good. But Jesus fed them, and the disciples witnessed this miracle. They saw the supernatural break into the natural. They saw that miracle. And then immediately after that, Jesus tells them to get into a boat and cross the Sea of Galilee. The sea of Galilee is a large freshwater lake in Israel. It's about 14 miles long, about 8 miles wide. So it's a big lake, but it's not that huge. But because of the topography around there, there's an area that is prone to storms. 
And the disciples, many of them were familiar with the lake. Several of them earned their living as fishermen on the lake. And so they are told to cross the, the Sea of Galilee by night. And so they head out. And in the middle of that night, there comes up a terrible storm. And Jesus knew that there would be a storm that night, but he sent his disciples anyway. You see, sometimes God allows us to go through storms. Sometimes God allows us to go through things, and they don't make sense to us. And we wonder why. right? Because we know that Jesus could turn five loaves and two fishes, right, two fish, into an incredible meal for thousands. He certainly could have caused that storm not to hit the disciples. He certainly could have given them smooth sailing. And sometimes it's easy to think, God should give me a smooth life. If I'm following Him, if I'm obeying Him, if I'm reading my Bible, if I'm doing these things, then God should make everything just fall into place. But that's not always His purpose. His purposes are sometimes so much deeper and greater than we could ever understand at the moment. You know, I struggled with that when I was in college and then in grad school, one of the things that I struggled with is that almost all of my friends were the either engaged or married, and I was extremely single. And I thought, this, this isn't fair, God. I get up early every morning, I read my Bible, I'm doing my devotions, I'm going to church. In fact, I'm preparing to go to serve you. You know, I, this isn't fair. And there was a message one night uh, that I was listening to at a, at a, in a church service. And from Exodus. And, and, uh, and that message, God used that message. It, the, the title of it was called Detours, Dead Ends, and Dry Holes. And it was about how God led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And it wasn't in a way that they expected or would have planned, but God had a purpose in it. And God used that message to teach me and to remind me that, that faith isn't about getting what I want. And then, you know, I had to realize that I had to trust God with His timing for my life. And as many of you know, it worked out pretty, pretty well, all right? Uh, one of my friends, when I got married, said that the strongest argument for the existence of God that he knew of was that Laura married me. So he saw it only as a divine miracle that, that he would take somebody as beautiful and intelligent and as poised as her and allow her to want to marry me. So miracles do happen, guys, all right? There's hope for you. Uh, in fact, my friend called it the Danological argument for the existence of God. <laughs> so so God, does, God does do things in ways that we would never expect, right? And he does them in incredible ways. And, but this night, Jesus could have prevented the storm. He, he could have, but he had a purpose for the storm. And so notice with me in verse 25 of Matthew 14, it says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them. They're, they're in the middle of the storm. They are, they are struggling. They are in diff they're in a life-threatening situation. They are fighting for their lives. And it says, Jesus went to them. And, and in, there are other accounts of this in the other Gospels, and one of them we're told that, that Jesus saw them. Right Before he ever came to them, he saw them. I want you to know today, Jesus sees you. He sees you. He sees you and he sees what you're going through. He sees what you're facing and what you're dealing with. That thing that maybe no one else knows about or only a few people know about, that struggle, that difficulty. Jesus sees you. And Jesus came to them. Because not only does Jesus see us, but he comes to us. He came to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and they said, it's a ghost. They're like, ghost, it's gotta be a ghost, right? It's, I mean, it's that time of the morning. I mean, they've been up all night. They're fighting for their lives, and now there's a ghost. But Jesus said, and they cried out in fear. Remember we said fear and faith? You know, they, I mean, these disciples just saw Jesus turn, turn a little meager lunch into a huge meal, but now they're afraid. And Jesus speaks, and he says, take courage. This is Matthew 14, 27. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus says, it's me. You don't have to be afraid. And then Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. Peter's like, I got a great idea. Like in the middle of all this craziness, he's like, how about I do what you're doing? And Jesus says one thing, come, come. And Peter jumps out of the boat, 
I sort of imagine probably, but Peter was a two feet person, right? He was like, all right, I'm out, right? You know, Peter was a bit impulsive, a bit of a stick his foot in his mouth kind of a guy, kind of act before he thinks, speak before he thinks. But in this instance, he exercises incredible faith, incredible faith. He, he jumps out of the boat and he starts walking on the water. He gets to do the impossible. But then, many of you are familiar with the story, it says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, there's a lot going on in this story, and we only have a few moments. But I want you to see what faith looks like. Faith is simply fixing your eyes on Jesus author and the finisher of your faith. It's, it's fixing your gaze on Him and trusting Him and obeying Him and following Him. And when Jesus says to come, He really means it. And He invites you to a life of trusting Him. And it's not always easy. And it doesn't always look perfect. In fact, look at Peter. He starts out so great. He's walking on the water, climbing up and down the waves, going to Jesus, Right? And all of a sudden, he looks around, and he sees this incredible wind, and I'm sure he sees the waves, and he thinks, what am I doing? Like, this is impossible, right? And he starts to sink. But he knows what to do. You know, we, we like to throw people. How many of you would say, if, I was walk- if Jesus told me to walk on the water, I wouldn't have doubted. I'd have walked all the way to him, high-fived him, and we would have walked back together. Anybody? How many of you say that would be you? All right, a few of you. Only over here. All right, Interesting. Yeah, a few of us think, man, I wouldn't have doubted. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have struggled. But, but we all doubt and we all struggle. But Peter, and, and we, we like to kind of like, man, Peter, how lame, right? But Peter actually had the courage to get out of the boat. Peach, Peter had the courage to follow Jesus, to trust him. And when he struggled and when he doubted, what did he do? He prayed, and it was not a long prayer, Right? Sometimes the, gr- the greatest prayers, the most powerful prayers you will pray will not be long prayers. He says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out his hand. Jesus didn't say, sorry, bro, you know, you doubted me, dude. Shouldn't have doubted me. Now you're going for a swim. You know, good luck. I hope you make it back to the boat. Right? Yeah, of course you laugh because it seems so silly and so absurd. But sometimes we think maybe that's how God's going to treat me. I failed. I doubted him. I struggled, I sinned, and maybe he's not going to reach out his hand. But I want you to know that Jesus will always reach out his hand for you. He, you are his child. If you are belong to him, you are his. He loves you with an unending and everlasting love. He knows you. He sees you. He sees what you're going through. He knows the struggles. And he will never, ever not reach out his hand for you. Never. It says, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and the disciples worshipped him, and they said, you really are the Son of God. Jesus used this experience, this storm, to take their faith to another level. Jesus used this in their lives in such a powerful, powerful way. You see, God allows the storms sometimes in our lives so that our faith will have the opportunity to be stretched, to grow, to trust Him. And here's the thing. I'm sure when they were in the storm that night and they're fighting for their lives, and I'm sure maybe wondering, where's Jesus? Right? Why did He tell us to get in the boat? Why, did, why now? I mean, we just had this great day of feeding the 5,000 and it was amazing, and why now? And I'm sure that it did not go through their minds. You know what, guys? I bet this is going to be in the Bible one day. <laughs> right? This, is, this, this story is going to be used... For, for generations, for thousands of years to inspire faith and encourage Jesus' followers. That I'm sure that what you see, here's the thing we never ever can fully understand what God is doing in any one moment. And it will not always make sense. And it will not always seem fair or even seem good. In fact, sometimes it really won't be good what is happening. But God is able to take everything, anything, even the not good things, and use them for good in your life. Romans chapter 8 says, God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Not everything is good, but God can work it for good. The wind and waves of life are real, and they can make faith hard. 
and maybe your faith has been battered a little bit. Maybe it's an issue at school, right? Maybe school for you is a struggle, or what you have to deal with at school is a struggle. Maybe it's a situation at home, right? Sometimes our life at home is, is difficult. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's a divorce that your parents have gone through or are going through. Maybe it's an issue with a sibling. Maybe it's a habit that you struggle with. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's anxiety, depression, fear, loss. Something you've gone through, hurt, injury. I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of things we say. The wind and waves of life are real, and they batter our faith at times. And we feel weak, and we feel like the wind and waves of life are going to overwhelm me, and they're going to, take, they're going to just take me under. And so what can you do? What do you do? Well, all you have to do is what Peter did. Say, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. I need you. I need you. There's a little song that was written. Uh, just, that's its title, Lord, I Need You. You know, oh, I need you. And God used that little song one day in my life when I was in a very difficult season of uncertainty uh, of what was coming in life. I had resigned from the church I was serving at out of a difficult situation, didn't know what was coming next, very overwhelmed. And I was driving down the road, and that song came on. I just started crying in the car, thankful I was alone. And, and, and it was just a reminder that, that all I needed was not the answers or this or that, but all I needed was Jesus. And all I needed to do was have my focus on Him. And so when you're in that place where faith is hard and faith is difficult, and there will come those times. It's normal. It's natural to have doubts, to have fears, to have worries. To say, you know what, life just feels like it's battering me right now. And I don't understand. Listen, Jesus sees you. He has not forgotten you. And he does not, he does not fail to love you or to care for you even in those difficult places. And you can trust him. And you can put your eyes and your focus on him. And you can say, I'm going to focus on not what is just what is seen, as Paul says, but what is unseen. And I'm going to ask God to help me. And if you will, He will help you. He will reach out His hand. He will not deny you. So I just want to give you three things real quickly. Living by faith requires focus. Living by faith requires focus. I know focus is hard, but you have to focus. And, and that means I have to say, I just can't focus on everything around me if all I do is watch the news, if all I do is scroll on social media, my faith is not going to be what? Strong. It's going to be overwhelmed. I have to focus on, I have to keep my eyes on Jesus. I have to be in his word. I have to be in prayer. I have to be in worship. I have to be in fellowship with other believers. It requires focus. Number two, living by faith requires worship. Right? In order to live by faith, I have to worship God. Right? I have to Lift my eyes, my heart, my whole being to who God is. And number three, living by faith requires Jesus. <laughs> living by faith requires Jesus. Here's the good news about that, is that we don't do it ourselves. Faith is a gift. We exercise it. We have to live by it, but faith is a gift, and Jesus enables our faith, and he empowers our faith. And so it's my prayer and my desire for each of you is that God would give you a fresh start, that you would live a life of obedience to Jesus. That you would live a life guided by God's wisdom. That you would live a life of love, of loving God and loving people. That you would walk in the light and that you'd walk by faith. Because I know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And I would love nothing more than to see you fulfill the purpose for which God created you and saved you. And so I want to pray for us this morning and pray that God will do that. But I want to pray specifically for you this morning. If the wind and waves of life have battered your faith, you're going through a difficult place right now in life. I want you to know that, first of all, Jesus sees you, He cares about you, and He loves you. But I also want you to know you're surrounded by people who also love you and care about you. And your counselors, your staff, myself, if you have something you want to talk about, you want to be prayed for, find me today, find me tomorrow. I'd love to pray for you about that thing. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that, that you love us so much. I thank you that you love us more than we understand, more than we deserve. And Father, I thank you that you will never stop loving us. I pray that you would help us to live lives of faith, of, of looking beyond what we see and living a life of trusting you. 
I thank you that you give us the gift of faith. Help us to exercise that gift. And Father, when the wind and waves of life batter us, I pray that we would know what to do, that we would look to you and simply say, Lord, save. And Father, I thank you that you not only invite us to come, but you also reach out your hand and you pick us up. And you say, why did you doubt? You can trust me. And you give us grace to trust you all over again. And so, Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I ask your blessing over this day. Father, all that will happen in dress rehearsals, in practice, in the fun that we'll have together, I just pray that in everything that we do today, you would be glorified and that you would guide us and direct us. Protect us and bless us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.